guests is here today. We planned this originally for a snowed out day almost a year ago, so here we are. Um, he is the conservation coordinator for the Nature Conservancy, which as you, I think you probably know is a national organization that does all kinds of good work here in Vermont, much good work including things like Park Hill and I don't know what all, lots. Um, he shepherds conservation projects all the way through and he divides his time between land protection, stewardship, and science. So he's, he's very busy. And I just asked him if he loved his job and he said, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I can only say who wouldn't. So please, welcome. That's a good one. Well, thank you. All right, so just to start, if, uh, if I lower in volume, someone just raise your hand and I'll make sure to speak up. Um, so yeah, my name is Gus Goodwin. I work at the Nature Conservancy here in Montpelier. And as uh, Lawrence said, I get to do lots of different things, but by far and away, my favorite piece of my work is working with the American Elms. It's something I just, it's, it's a wonderful program. And when I first started, I didn't really think too much about it. I mean, why wouldn't you want to bring back a species? It's, it's an elm, it's beautiful, enough said. But as I worked more and more on it and I learned some of the science and the rationale for why the Nature Conservancy is working on the elm, it became an even more compelling story. And that's what my goal here today is, to kind of show you the whole picture of why we're working on elm and why we think it's so important. And this is the story I knew when I started working with the Nature Conservancy. So this is a street scene um, from Michigan, 1971 on the top, 1984 below. And you can see just the really dramatic changes, uh, the loss of all of those elms. And Dutch elm disease arrived in the United States in about 1928, and it was on a shipment, shipment of wood bound for Ohio. It came from the Netherlands, and it landed in New York. And then when the, the disease kind of radiated out from there, it's a fungal pathogen, and it's spread by bark beetles, which are both native and non-native. So these beetles kind of carried this disease around, and it spread across the country. And it really got going in the 50s and 60s, 60s when a second strain of the disease emerged and it was really particularly deadly. And by the late 80s, more than 75% of the elms in the, across the United States uh, and North America had died. And a similar story played out on our floodplains. So this is a photo um, of the Red River up in Saskatchewan. It's taken in 1997. And all of those trees are big, healthy, mature elms. And this is one of the last places on the continent for Dutch elm disease to arrive. It's right at the northwestern edge of the range for American elm, the furthest away from that introduction point, and one of the last places for the disease to arrive. And while this doesn't look exactly like our floodplains would have before the arrival of Dutch elm disease, it's actually fairly similar. We have a lot of evidence from uh, botanical surveys, witness trees, um, journal articles, that elm was a really important place, or a really important tree in our floodplains. And so something like this may have, may have been a common site on the Connecticut River. And before really kind of getting going with the elm story, I also want to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the Nature Conservancy. Um, as Lawrence said, we're a global organization. We're one of the world's leaders in conservation. Uh, we were founded in 1951, uh, first in the state of New York. We're now in all 50 states and 71 other countries. We've protected 119 million acres of land. That's 20 times the size of Vermont, or one Texas. <laughs> Uh, we've done 5,000 miles of river protection, marine sanctuaries, and we have over a million people who are members and support our work. And here in Vermont, uh, we've been here since uh, 1961, I believe. 1960, our first project was Molly Bog in central Vermont. It's now one of UVM's natural areas. Since then, we've helped protect over 183,000 acres in Vermont, and we do a whole bunch of different types of work. We've bought land, we helped transfer land, we've worked with the state and the feds and protected a lot of places that you've probably been to or heard of like Mount Mansfield, Camel's Hump, Long Trail. We've, our work has helped build those natural areas across the state and the map on the left shows where our work is touched down and the map on the right shows the lands that we currently own and manage. We have 56 natural areas totaling about just shy of 30,000 acres and they're all open to the public and they're wonderful places to visit. Um, 
Our nearest one is Chickering Bog in Calais. Has anybody been there? Yeah, it's just, it's beautiful. It's one of my favorites. Um, and then we also have a bunch of land protected through conservation easements for an extra 30,000 acres that's that we're responsible for stewarding. And uh, while we're best known for our land protection work, our work is actually very varied. And I want to show you this slide because I think it totally captures the kind of ambition and scope of our mission. So this is uh, in the Maidstone, town of Maidstone, Northeast Kingdom. We're looking across the Connecticut River over into New Hampshire. And in the foreground is the Davit Tract, which is uh, part of our Maidstone Bends natural area. Um, we're assembling this area bit by bit, piece by piece, to try and create a really big block of high quality floodplain on the Connecticut that's protected. And you can see in the background, there's a really nice piece of floodplain forest. And in the foreground, we've got a hay field that we, uh, we lease out to a farmer. You'll also see a really large uh, riparian buffer that we planted to help stabilize the riverbanks, uh, filter runoff, and jumpstart the establishment of future floodplain forests. Then there's the river itself. Uh, the Connecticut River is a long-standing priority for the Nature Conservancy. We actually have a special team devoted just to working on issues related to the Connecticut River. And they do um, habitat assessments, um, under, they do science to help us understand critical river processes, and they're actually even working with hydro dams to figure out how to release water from the dams in a way that mimics the natural flooding regime. And then further off in the background, you see Nash Stream State Forest. It's about 40,000 acres that, the T, that TNC helped uh, the state of New Hampshire and the federal government protect. And then lastly, the 10,000 acre Vicki Bunnell Preserve, which the Nature Conservancy owns and manages as a wilderness area as a complement to all of the active working forests that surround it. And I think this really shows the breadth of our vision. And you may wonder, well, where does the elm fit in? You know, that's such a huge landscape scale visit. And why, you know, why devote all this effort to a single species? And that's the question I want to answer for you guys. Um, so here is that same area in, in Maidstone under flood in 2011. Let's see. So floodplains, they're critical to our well-being. They provide critical habitat and they help reduce the severity of floods on downstream towns. And as destructive as this looks, this is actually a really important ecosystem process. It provides unique habitat, it helps rebuild soil fertility, and it helps the river kind of stay stable over time rather than fighting against its banks. But for our flooding to be healthy, our forests need to be healthy. And that's where the elm starts to figure into the equation. <coughs> So our team, led by Dr. Christian Marks, did a huge comprehensive study of floodplain forests along the Connecticut, tip to tail. They looked at uh, over 100 sample sites. They measured like 15,000 trees. They described all the different types of floodplain forest on the length of the river. And they identified the critical habitats that are remaining. And then they also worked um, to quantify the relationship between vegetation and ecosystem processes. So remember I said that we're working with the hydro dams to figure out a natural flooding regime. This team actually figured out how much flooding in days each different species needs to thrive. So if you can say, if we can release, if we can get four days of flooding downstream, that's gonna really help elm. Or if we need to protect species X, we know that we need to figure out how to create this many days of natural flooding. So it's a really powerful data set. Um, but as far as the elm goes, there's really two critical um, pieces, uh, conclusions that came out of this work. And the first is, is that there's not enough high quality floodplain habitat left to meet our conservation goals. So there's a, a shortage of habitat on the Connecticut River. So we have to begin to think about restoration if we want to be building more habitat on the river. And the second is that if we want to do restoration, we have to figure out what to do about Dutch elm disease. And I should say, if people have questions, if I'm going too fast, like please answer, like raise your hand. I'm ha happy to answer questions as we, as we go through all this. Um, but if you want to wait till the end, that works for me too. Um, 
So today, ELM is still widespread. This is a, a graph um, that came out of that research I was just describing, and there's kind of two important things that you should notice in this. So uh, along the bottom, we have the different types of tree species you can find on the floodplain in Connecticut. So we've got silver maple, American elm, red maple, green ash, box elder, sycamore, and a handful of others. And the important con conclusion here is that elm is the second most abundant tree. So you see the blue, the blue line, that's the number of trees. So it's the second most abundant tree on all of our floodplains. And the red bar shows us that it's the most widespread. It occurs at over 90% of the sites along the Connecticut. And it's actually the only tree species that we found that occurs in every single type of floodplain forest along the whole length of the rivers. Question. Yeah. They're not dead. They're not dead, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this, that's kind of like the big mystery, right? You know, well we lost, like look at our streets, there's no more elms, but then what the heck? Um, so th that's, that's exactly what's going on, it, or this is what's happening, and that's kind of the question. Um, so why are there still all these elms around, and is Dutch elm disease affecting our floodplains if there's still so many elms? Um, yeah? So are these are elm trees that have been there all along, or are these are new elm trees? New ones. No, um, there's, they're not resistant yet. Um, they, so what happens is the elms, they reproduce and then they die. So the disease allows, it doesn't kill the trees at a young age, they're still able to reproduce. So the elms are perpetuating on the landscape, they're just not getting big. And so that's what this graph shows, I think, very clearly. Um, so we have elm in dark gray and silver maple in light gray. And across the bottom, we have the size of the tree trunk. So, you know, a proxy for how big and old it is. And then we have just the number of trees on the y-axis. And you can see that in the small size classes, elm and silver maple are pretty evenly matched. But you get to a certain point, about two feet in diameter, and the elm just drops off. So that's part of the, the story. It's not getting big. Um, and if you go back and think about just the sheer number of trees, I think that the shortfall between elm and silver maple, shown in blue, is kind of explained by that big gap in size. So the, as I was saying, the pathogen kills the tree at a certain time, but it's not early enough to kill the tree before it reproduces. So there's all these elms out there, they're still vulnerable to the disease, but they're able to reproduce and set seed and kind of create new seedlings that are not either that resistant. And that's a problem because elm, big elms especially, play a big role in our floodplains. Um, yeah, they're just, they're not reaching their full potential, their ecological maturity, and that leaves an important like ecological niche or a seat at the table unfilled in our floodplain. So there's this big hole that's missing that can only really be filled by large mature elms. And we know that elms get big, and we know that they get old. Um, at one point in time, I think most of the big trees ever observed in New England were elms, um, the historic big trees. This is the Sheffield elm from, uh, in Massachusetts, and it was so big that 500 people could sit in its shade during town meeting. <laughs> And when it died in the early 1920s, they estimated that it would be about 400 years old. So we know elms get big, we know they get old, but they're just not because of the way the disease is killing the trees at about their middle age. Okay, so why does that matter? Um, mature elms occupy this unique ecological role. And without that, our floodplains are kind of, they have an empty seat. And I want to show you a little bit about what that might look like and why this is important. So thinking about a river system, right? So here's a generic stream cross section. It's going like this. Um, and it's not hard to imagine that closest to the river at lowest elevations, we get a lot of flooding, and as you go uphill, you get less flooding. So there's this gradient of flood severity, and the tree species, each species has kind of a, a sweet spot where of it likes flooding, or it tolerates flooding, or it can't handle it at all. So along that gradient of low flooding to high flooding, you're gonna find a special spot for each tree species. An elm, for example, is kind of about three quarters of the way up. Um, way up top, you'd find sugar maple and beech. You know, those are species that don't like to be flooded. 
and then right down by the water you'd find silver maple. And the other neat thing to consider is this concept of forest development. Um, so the river, remember we saw this stream channel like this? It doesn't actually stay put in time, it moves back and forth as the river moves back and forth. And this photo shows the movement of a river. And this is again right that same natural area we keep looking at up on the Connecticut River. So in this photo the river is actually moving from the right into the left and you can see it's cutting into that big stream bank. That's actually a field we, we manage uh, and the loss of soil there has been something like 60 feet a decade. Uh, so the river's moving really fast in that area. A decade. Yeah, we had to go out and move. we have a riparian buffer section and we had to move the signs or like fish them out of the river. You know, we set them up and you know, they're, they're, most of them are gone. Um, but the, point, uh, the kind of the one thing to think about is so as the move, river is moving across the slide, we're actually gaining ground on this side. So we've got this kind of nice sandy, um, sandy substrate. And some species like cottonwood and willow really thrive in this environment. They can handle the direct sun, the dry soils, it, dry in the summer, the flooding. Um, and this is, they're kind of the first ones to arrive in this new environment and we call them pioneer species. And as the river continues to move left, the land on the right will continue to get a little higher and a little drier and the pioneer species will change the environment, they'll change the soil chemistry, the soil texture, and all of these things kind of make it ready for the next cohort of species to come along. On the Connecticut, this is often silver maple. So we have this kind of predictable change in species based on the age of the landform. And another way to think about this is maybe if you've paddled a canoe down the river, like imagine you're paddling down this river here, you land your canoe, you hop out, you're on the hot sand, and you walk and you walk slightly uphill and then eventually you kind of reach this like chest high thicket of shrubs and bushes and you punch through that and you walk back a little further and then there's kind of that big berm that you kind of have to crawl over before you end up in the, the dark forest. And so that is another way to think about the gradient um, and that's a very predictable occurrence along the Connecticut River. And that's that dark forest where elm does well. It's a species that's unique amongst all the floodplain species because it reproduces well under a shady canopy. So those other species, they need full sunlight to get started and elm is the only species in that mix that does well under a shaded canopy. So if you think about forests, you know, if there's a trajectory with a beginning and an end or a cycle that maybe restarts again, the elm is the tree that shows up right at the end. It's the tree that's part of the most mature, fully developed floodplain forest. Question. Yes? What's happening on the right bank? This is the, the deposition of a point bar. Um, so the, as the river is cutting into this area here, it's depositing sands here. And so this area is actually getting higher and drier and this is the area where the, the, the forest is developing. And eventually the, it'll be a shortcut across because it won't go all the way up. And yeah, exactly, yeah. It will continue to develop and change. All right, so I, th I think kind of the important piece we're getting at and we're, we're going to arrive at this, this kind of diagram that made me really understand the importance of ELM. Um, so we have these two concepts. We just talked about flood frequency and we also talked about forest age. And so if you can kind of wrap your head around the fact that right by the river you're going to have lots of flooding and younger forests or younger landforms, like the age of the trees may be determined by who's cut them most recently, but it's going to be younger forest right by the river. And further back, you're going to have less flooding and slightly older forest. And if you were to measure the importance of the trees along that gradient, this is what it would look like. So this is kind of the, we're going to take some time and walk through this because I think this is really a nice depiction of why elm is an important species. So this is, this came out of the um, research that I've been describing by Dr. Christian Marks and it shows uh, two sites along the Connecticut River. 
And on the bottom, you can see there's an axis that says distance from beach. So think about that also being forest age and amount of flooding. So on the left side, lots of flooding, younger forests. On the right side, a little bit less flooding, older forests. And then the y-axis is the tree dominance, which is a forester's measure of how important a tree is. It takes into account the number of those trees, where they're growing relative to the other trees, and their size. Um, but it kind of it's a good bundle uh, uh, index for how important a tree is. And you can see that right by the water, um, the shrubs, so that's black willow and box elder, are the most important. Then comes silver maple, and then comes elm. And I think what I love about this is it shows that these species occupy these distinct spots on this graph. Um, and I think that we can think of our floodplains that way. And these are distinct spots that each species occupies. And losing a species not only just reduces the number of species that are available, so it's not like if we lost elm, we just have two species. The consequence is that we lose a species that provides a really distinct role that other species can't provide. <clears throat> Elm is the dotted black line. Yes, with almost Americana right on top there. Yep, great question. Um, and I mentioned earlier that we'd been able to, with, through this research, we could figure out exactly how much flooding they need. Elm requires four days, four days of flooding. Um, yes. All at once. Over the course of the year. I, I wanted to ask about the invasive species that we find along all of our rivers here in central Vermont. Does the Connecticut not have any of these Japanese bushes that just sprout up and just <coughs> really terribly? They do, and they also have uh, bittersweet, and all of those things alter forest floodplain and function. But those are, you know, those are things you can, you can manage or you can accept, uh, depending on the amount of resources you have. Um, but it, and as far as it relates to forest development, it it can limit which species can get established at a site. So do you get rid of them? Is that part of the plan for the Connecticut? River? We do manage on our on our lands when when we're able to. Yeah, but there are some sites where management is you have to explore different strategies. And this is a, this is a this is an invasive species management strategy, right? The Dutch Dutch elm disease is an invasive species that's affecting the function of our floodplain forest. So the work I'll describe next is one strategy for addressing that. But that's, a, that's a great question. OK. Um, oh, I also, just to piggyback off the concept of invasive species, I want to say that uh, green ash, which is susceptible to the emerald ash borer, which we've been hearing, hearing a lot about, is a tree species that on the southern stretch of the river is fairly similar to elm. Uh, and we're likely to see that one kind of wink out um, and succumb to emerald ash borer over time. So I think to kind of put those concepts together, you know, it's, we're really looking at a loss of diversity and function in our floodplains. And that's something we should be alarmed about in any setting. But I think that for floodplains, it's particularly worrisome because we're down to, at least in northern Vermont, mostly silver maple. So it's kind of like that street we were looking at in Michigan with one species lining both sides of the river. And that's, that's a very vulnerable spot to be in, especially for an ecosystem that provides so much for our well-being like floodplains do. I saw a hand. I just wanted to clarify what you mean by floodplain. It sounds like you might just be talking about a few miles each side of the Connecticut River, but I think you're talking about the whole watershed. and. Wherever there are rivers that have floodplains? Yes. Yeah, we have a real strong emphasis on the Connecticut River, so that's why I keep defaulting to it. But elm would grow in floodplains on rivers big and small across the whole state. Yeah. Great question. You can say later. What, what happens if you don't do anything about the floodplains? What's, what's, good, what's bad if the floodplain is destroyed or messed up? Or, you know, like what, are, what are we? What, what, are, the, what are we losing? The problem is the management. Yeah. Um, so floodplains, um, well, one, they provide biodiversity. So there's a lot of species that are kind of floodplain obligate. Um, it helps slow um, the flow of water. So by allowing the water to hop up on its banks and kind of dissipate a lot of energy, it makes flooding less destructive. Um, let's see. It's. We got that. We did. It provides water quality benefits by allowing some additional filtration and ways for it to settle. So 
you know, if, if you've got a lot of nutrients in the water, having them suspend up onto a forest or a field and deposit those nutrients is a really good fate for nutrients rather than having them get flushed downstream further. Um, yeah, and then of course the habitat and biodiversity benefits as well. Yep. And I want to just talk a little bit about elms and wildlife because I think this is this is an important thing we overlook sometimes. Um, so a big, yeah, isn't that thing neat? Um, so that is one of about 200 species of moths and butterfly that are known to feed on the American elm. Uh, and what I love about this one is that it's actually it's co-evolved to have that stegosaurus shape that looks just like the margin of the leaf. So it's kind of a great defense mechanism. Um, that's, yeah, right there. Uh, it's a great nesting site for a lot of songbirds, including the Baltimore Oriole. And we know that vase shape. It's actually a super canopy tree, so it sticks its branches way up above all the other trees, which makes it really good habitat for bald eagles, which like to nest in kind of the highest thing around. They get a good vantage point. Um, and then on top of that, anytime you can get big, old, shaggy trees, it's just great for wildlife. Uh, mammals, birds, insects, the whole package. Um, one of our scientists described uh, Big Elm as kind of like an apartment complex for wildlife. So, All right, um, so to kind of just recap, we've, Elm is really important for our floodplain forests, particularly our northern ones. Elm is present, but it's not surviving to reach ecological maturity, and that makes our floodplains vulnerable because they're missing some sort of critical component that would define their structure and function. And so I guess the next question is like, what does it take to bring back a species? How can we undo this and you know, what, is, what are we doing about it? And that's kind of the exciting part of this pr presentation. And, um, you know, the short answer for American elm is that it takes survivors. Um, they say about one in every 10,000 elms has some degree of tolerance to Dutch elm disease. And over the years, um, we've worked with landowners and you know, our partners and just kind of always kept an eye out the window uh, whenever we're on road trips. And we've identified maybe 150 trees that we believe have potential to be survivors uh, and tolerate that exposure to Dutch elm disease. And over the years, some of these have been identified and propagated by the nursery trade. So you can actually buy something like a Princeton elm, or maybe you've heard of um, like Valley Forge or Delaware. There's a, a handful of different elm varieties that you can purchase that have been propagated by the nursery trade because they're tolerant of exposure to Dutch elm disease, which is wonderful. The trouble is, is that there's not enough genetic diversity in those selections for us to go out and start restoring our floodplains because we'd be essentially planting clones, genetically similar or identical individuals across all of our restoration projects. And if the disease evolved even the slightest amount, all of those trees could be susceptible to disease and we'd be right back where we started. So it's really critical for our work if we want to think about restoring floodplains with elm to have a lot of genetic diversity. Uh, so we're working with the Forest Service um, to kind of cultivate this genetic diversity. And I want to draw the distinction between escapers and survivors. Um, so it's, remember the disease, it's a fungal pathogen that's spread by bark beetles. So the beetles need to fly from tree to tree to expose the tree to the disease. And the beetles have a flight range of about 300 feet. So it's really pretty possible for an elm to grow up without ever having been exposed to the disease. And maybe you've seen, you drive through a, like a farm field around here is a really good place to see one. There's one huge elm in the middle of the field. Um, and that tree may have reached that big size just simply because it was never exposed to the disease. What we look for are trees like the one on the right, um, which is hard to make out in this photo. This is also incidentally from our Maidstone Bend's natural area. Um, but that's a big elm and all the little trees right next to it, it's a hedgerow of dead young elms. And so we know that those trees are dying from Dutch elm disease. Their branches go up and they intermingle with the crown of that tree. So it's surely been, the big tree has surely been exposed to Dutch elm disease. So we know that it's warding off at least this current round of um, the disease. 
And on a related note, we tend to look for trees that are bigger um, under the assumption that they've survived maybe a couple exposures to the disease um, and that they're also older. But we know that um, size doesn't always correlate with age. And also, oh, go ahead, yeah. But when you find the ones nearby, elms nearby, aren't those uh, offspring of the other trees, which shows it's, there's still a susceptibility to it? Um, right, so the disease tolerance is kind of a spectrum. It's not like a yes or no type thing. So the parents will vary in their ability to tolerate the disease. And the other thing is that elms are wind pollinated. So there's a lot of pollen falling, flying around. And so the mature elm, let's say this individual is disease tolerant, it's breeding with individuals that are not disease tolerant. So the, that is getting lost which is actually exactly why we do what I'm about to explain in the next couple slides. Um, I promise I'll explain it. I, now I'm remembering we have something else to look at first. <laughs> but that's a great question, and that's exactly what's happening in our floodplains and why we, why we need to help. Because without it, even the survivors are still going to have the genes diminished by the, the, the susceptible trees. So we need an intervention. Um, which would be a great thing to talk about now, but instead I was just going to tell you how much I love trying to figure out uh, which trees are survivors and which ones are escapers. It's just a great game I get to play in the field. This is one of, one of my contributions. Um, and this tree here is uh, in front of a beautiful farm in Colebrook, New Hampshire. Uh, it's a bicentennial farm. It's been in the same family since like 17... 90 or 80 something. It's really, it's, it's cool. It's a cool place to be. It's a beautiful tree. Um, but at first glance, based on everything we've just talked about, it looks like it's likely an escaper, right? It's a big tree in the middle of a farm field, nothing else around it. Um, but I spent a lot of time talking with the landowners and we looked at um, some old records they had at the house, including, uh, I don't know if this has the feel of a Hallmark, Hallmark calendar or placemat to you, but that's exactly what it is. The farm's been photographed for these various promotional materials on several occasions. and So we're able to look back and see, oh, there's, there's actually a couple elms there. We looked at an etching done by a family member of the farm, and you can see there's a couple trees there. And then we had um, some old photos of the farm itself, you know, from showing a, the tree in the back is an elm. Um, so we had a couple different lines of converging evidence that say, yeah, this tree probably did survive, and its neighbors didn't, so it's likely to be a, a good candidate. And this is a tree we have enrolled uh, in our breeding program. We found about 80 trees so far that we think have a pretty high likelihood of being survivors. So, to answer your question more directly um, about, you know, what do we do? How do we ensure that these trees? mate with the best possible mates to ensure that the genes are kind of passed down to their offspring. Um, so in the spring, we send an arborist up into the tree. I don't know if you can make them out there, way at the end there. It's kind of heart stopping to watch these guys in the tree. Uh, he's tied in, but... Um, that was a squirrel. No, yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, so they go up and they cut down a couple of little twigs for us from each tree that we've identified. And an elm tree has uh, two types of buds on the twig. So these big plump ones are the flower buds, and then the one at the ends are the leaf buds. I think they look kind of like hitchhiker's thumbs right at the end there. Um, and what we do is we, we cut them, we put them in a big cardboard box, and we ship them overnight to our partners at the Forest Service in Ohio. So that's how we kind of we isolate the genetic material and we send it off there. The Forest Service has big plantations of trees that have proven to be tolerant of the disease. So they have, you know, they have like tons of Princeton elms and then Valley Forge elms. And so they have all these trees in a big orchard, a big elm orchard. Um, and we kind of joke that this is like the dating service. So we're, you know, making sure that these trees from New England and the Midwest have a chance to get together. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's fascinating. The, the Forest Service is just, they're an outstanding partner and they have such an incredible amount of expertise on this. I had the great fun of sitting, we did a, a tree exchange in um, western New York this spring. I drove out and we like picked up the trees from them and we drove it the rest of the way. 
And um, they were describing this process, and it's just it's fascinating. So each tree that we send from Vermont, they get all these branches. They're in this lab in Ohio, and each tree has its own room. They stick the, you know, all these twigs are in a vase, and they're each in their own room so that there's no pollen contamination. And then they wait for the pollen to fall out of the flower buds on wax paper, and then they, they collect it. And then they very carefully go out into their elm orchard where they've identified parent trees, and they've actually bagged the flowers so that they can't be pollinated by any other elms. And then they like snake a little tube in that's got compressed air, and then they fill the bag with pollen. Um, Amazing. And it's, it's, just, it's just genius. It's so cool. Every, every blossom. Uh, not every blossom, but enough of them. And then the other crazy part is then they have to know which ones they did, and they wait for the seeds to develop. Um, so that's that's really neat. That's how they do that. All the pollinators on all the other blossoms, like the bumblebees and stuff, are on all the other blossoms. Yeah, that's a, um, and actually elm is it's wind pollinated, so the pollinators don't have a real direct role. Um, but by isolating them with those bags, we can really ensure that we know that parent A is mating with parent B, and that's what we want. Yeah, and then they keep track of them. Right, and, and you keep the bag on until the seeds drop yeah. off into the bag. Yeah. Um, and I should say that they actually do two things. So they do that process I just described, and then the other thing they do is they take the leaf bud and they cut it off and then they graft it onto a little baby seedling and they grow it from there. So that's how they clone the trees. So we have two pathways going. We have the experimental elm dating service and then we have the cloning uh, process. And the cloning is really important um, because there's no test for genetic, or no test for tolerance of Dutch elm disease. You just you have to expose the tree to the disease and see if it makes it. And because the disease and the, toler the tolerance to the disease is kind of a spectrum and it's a little bit of a mixed bag, we need a lot of different trees, even if they're all genetically similar, and it, to then expose them all and kind of collect the average uh, tolerance for all these trees. Uh, the yeah. you can buy from the nursery, are those the ones that the Forest Service has shipped out to nurseries? To yes, and many of them are actually being propagated by nurseries themselves. So if, there's a lot of different brand names. There's the, um, and those are all, the thing to look for is whether or not they've been tested by the Forest Service. And unfortunately, one of the really common ones, the Liberty Elm, has never been tested by the Forest Service and hasn't held up well to the field trials. So it's not one we can recommend, although they have a great name. I really like it. <laughs> um, Okay, so now we've got, we've got those seeds, and then what happens next is they send the seeds back to Vermont, um, and we grow them into seedlings at our Pulteney Nursery, um, and, and we have a couple other partners, partners in this, but the, the Pulteney Nursery is kind of the epicenter for this work, and they grow into little seedlings. They get about this tall and you know, a little bit bigger around than a number two pencil, um, and then they're prepped for planting. Each seedling gets a number, so we can go back through the genetic records and figure out who the parents were or if it's a clone, um, and they, they get all this protective material. And then we go out and plant them. And the planting is just, it's the highlight of the year. It's so much fun, and we have wonderful partners with Fish and Wildlife um, and other state agencies. Some of our elms are planted on state land. Um, so we had, at one site, we had to like take them across the river on a little boat ride. So it's just kind of felt very mythical and important. Um, we work with professional tree planters. I mean, we're planting 2,000 trees at a time, so we, we have to have a lot of help. We have just outstanding volunteers um, and a handful of really excited landowners. I don't know if you recognize this tree, but it's the one um, right in front of that Wallace farm that I was showing you, and that's uh, Mr. Wallace with his tree in the back drop. He's thrilled that we're as psyched about his tree as he is. And um, in the foreground, you can't really make it out, but we planted a, a baby Princeton elm there to try and replace some of the ones he lost. And uh, they're very generous and let us sample from their tree a couple times. And we're about three quarters of the way through this effort so far. We have 7,000 experimental elms in the ground. Most of them are planted up in the Northeast Kingdom. We have a couple of sites where we've done really dense plantings, and you can see these maps. Each black dot is an elm, so there's a couple thousand at each of these sites. 
Um, and the other thing I should mention is that we're not planting just elms. We alternate as we go down a row, we alternate with um, other trees. We call them spacer trees to space out the grid. And those trees are silver maple, um, balsam poplar, other native tree species. So what we're accomplishing here is, one, we're doing this huge experiment to try and propagate elms, but we're also doing active floodplain restoration. So even if the elms fail, we have some advanced regeneration there that can start to restore these floodplains. And there's also the benefit of having those spacer trees keeping the elms from root grafting, uh, which minimizes the chance that they would spread disease through that pathway. Um, and we also have something like 25 other sites across Vermont that we've planted with smaller numbers of trees. And we think of those as, um, we call them sentinel sites. So this is like at one of our natural areas, we'll plant 30 elms of a mixture of different genetic types so that, you know, we've got these little beachheads for genetic diversity where we can start to radiate the tree outwards. And baby trees the natural way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, then we'll let them take it from there. Um, but yeah, we plant them right in a grid together so that they can, you know, intermingle and we just hope that, you know, we'll be able to kind of accelerate this process. And I was going to mention it later, but now seems like a good time. But one of the advantages of doing this kind of huge living experiment um, is that hopefully it allows the trees to co-evolve with the disease. So one of the risks of like a, if we were to only be thinking about doing this in our urban forests, like just planting on street trees, um, they don't have enough like intermingling um, so that if the disease were to evolve, let's say the disease evolves in all of our Princetons um, now are vulnerable, it wipes through all the different elms, but there's not any genetic diversity in the understory. You know, it's, it's just not a lot of insurance. Um, so we're hoping that by having this kind of more wild setting that the elms can kind of co-evolve with the disease. Um, and so some of our initial plantings are doing pretty well. Um, not all of them are. We have about 75% mortality, but that's, you know, for a, a big tree planting, that's not really that bad. I mean, we, it's not like we can be out there and care for them every day. Um, and these ones are about eight years old and they're, they're thriving. Um, we have trouble with deer. They yeah. like to, for whatever reason, they seem to prefer the elm over anything else we plant. But we spray them with, oh, go ahead. My hostas, they like that. Yeah. Oh, well, we should come up and plant ha hostas. <laughs> um, we do, uh, we spray them with deer repellent and we try and keep the competition down and we, we mow around them. So we're trying to ensure these trees have the best shot. Um, yeah, so yeah, this year we planted 2,000 plus elms. Next spring we're going to do 2,000 more, and then the year after that we're hopefully going to do about 2,000 more. And that should bring us to about 11,000 elms total. Um, what do you wrap them with at the bottom when you're shipping them? Um, these ones are in little square pots. Um, and then the white thing is, it's just called tree wrap. And what that does is it helps keep the... Uh, voles and mice from yes. eating the trees. Um, we actually, so this photo shows a different strategy we used to use, um, these bigger blue tubes. Um, and the, what would happen is that the moles and vice, moles and mice. mice and voles, there's a spoonerism there I couldn't get over. Um, the little rodents, they would get in there and then either they were hungry or they just got bored while they were waiting out the winter in their nice little like rodent condo and they would just, they would eat the base of the tree and, and girdle them. Um, and then the, the crazy thing to wrap our heads around after all this work I just described is we're going to go out and we're going to expose every single tree to Dutch elm disease and we'll see which ones make it and which ones don't. Wow. And uh, yeah. So that kind of brings up a question that I'm sitting here thinking all of what you're doing here is to create disease resistant trees. But is there another angle, and I want to use the word vaccination because that's what it would be if it were humans or males, to like, um, to protect the trees from the disease, something along the lines of the Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. You can, it's not a vaccination, but it, essentially it's an injection you give your tree um, and it, that will ward off the Dutch elm disease. It's a okay. fungicide, but it costs like $200 per tree wow. and you have to do it every three years. Why? Wow. Yeah. 
doesn't last. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, you have to, you kind of fumigate the soil and you inject the tree and... Um, but does it work? It does, it, it works great. And that's why if you go to Dartmouth College, they still have these huge street elms. And um, yep, and Manitoba, I think, is like elm capital of the world. And they've just decided they're gonna spend a lot of money to keep their elms. How long, because I used, I lived on that street. Maybe not that street, but the one over there, or the one in the yeah. cathedral, we call them cathedrals. Yeah. Right, they're gone. So how long has that been available, that ability to, and, um, I don't know if is the right word, but. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know when it became available, but it's one of those things that's just, it's too, too expensive to be feasible in the long run. You have to, because I've thought about that, because I have yeah. some nice little elms. Um, where do you, where do you find somebody to do that? A tree service will do it. Mm -hmm. oh. Yep. You were doing it in the 70s in Connecticut at Hotchkiss Prep School. Did oh, yeah. Yeah. Is it copper sulfate? Yeah. I'm not sure what it is. I think that's what they were using. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, there have been a lot of different strategies, um, including I was reading you know, uh, you know, portions of Silent Spring, that Rachel Carson book. The Silent Spring, it kind of, it's about, um, they used to spray down the elms with this fungicide um, to really, and, and insecticide to try and kill the bark beetles and protect them. And that was kind of the, the cascade that led to the Silent Spring. Or in the book, yeah. When and where was Dutch elm disease first diagnosed in this country? Um, in New York, I think in their late 20s. 20s? Yep. Okay. Yep. And do we know how it arrived by ship? It did, yep. It was a, a, like a, a load of veneer, elm veneer, bound for Ohio. So I think it was probably even, I think it was like burl veneers or something, but... Yeah. To go back to Holland, what happens to the fungus there and the mm -hmm. trees? Uh, that's a really good question. Yeah. And I was going to try and pounce on that following your question, um, but because it, it's very closely related. Um, I believe where the pathogen is native, the trees have evolved some sort of resistance to it. So that they have a, they're co evolved where neither one really wipes out have the other. Have you used any of that seed stock? Well, so that's what's really interesting about American elm. So in chestnut, yeah. they do that. They've said, oh, we can, and that's an invasive species in general. That's a strategy you can use. You can say, okay, like we've got, you know, this tree in North America is being killed by a virus from Europe. Let's go to Europe and we'll see if there's anything in the same, same genus, really closely related that tolerates that virus. And then we'll breed them together. Um, and that's what they're doing with chestnut, but with elm, the American elm is interesting because it's what's called a tetraploid, which means that it has, yeah, it has two sets of chromosomes, which means it can't mate with any of the other members of its genus. So that's the only way we can do this, is, um, is work through our survivors and propagate them. But with other species, exactly, you would do that. So that's what they're doing with chestnut, um, and then with the with ash, they're taking even a different method. Um, so they're the, the disease, it's not a disease, it's an insect pest. So what they're gonna do there is likely look for a biocontrol. So they'll go back to the native range of that insect and they'll see what other insects eat that, the emerald ash borer beetle, and then we can release that. And we've actually, we have done some of that along the Connecticut. Um, the Nature Conservancy has worked with other folks to do some releases, and I don't, know if we have any preliminary results yet, but that's an excellent question. It can really backfire. Yeah, but the process has gotten really very rigorous as a result of those early mistakes. Um, so I think that we can have more confidence. It's definitely always scary, um, but I think that the process has really evolved a lot as, as a consequence of some pretty bad mistakes. Yes? This is sort of a different question, but I grew up on one of those farms that had a huge elm right in the front. Yeah. Door, and all the elms I ever saw had a huge thing coming out with a kind of an arm, and, and, and I don't see that on any of these elm trees. They all the elms around here had this kind of a one limb that went out like this. And hmm. Baltimore Orioles were always in the top, and it was like, you know, it was all stood there by itself all alone in our front yard yeah. until about 1960 when it got the disease. 
And I, I just am surprised that these elms look so very different from the elms I remember in this area particularly that had this huge hmm. overhanging, you know, and, and they were much, they, they went, didn't have any leaves on the top, it was all up on the top. And it, it, it doesn't, you know, these mature elms that I remember in this particular area. I grew up in Wadesfield. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really know how to speak to that. I, I, trees have such a variable form depending on the like minute characters of the environment they grow in. Um, and the, the elm does have a fairly distinctive shape. And that those traits in the nursery trade, the, the people who are working to identify tolerant trees in that trade are taking things like that really seriously because that's an important characteristic for a street tree. It's not something we consider as much in our work. The things that we're looking for are disease tolerance and then site tolerance because we want trees that are adapted to our cold winters and are, you know, and to working with the other tree species in our ecosystem. Most of the cultivars that have been identified are from the mid-Atlantic or the Midwest and they just, they don't have what it takes to thrive in Colebrook, New Hampshire. So that's one of the, the main goals of our program, but other people are tracking those growth forms. Yep. I guess that was going to be my question. So there are other programs in other areas of, yes. of, of yeah. the states doing similar work? Um, I don't know the exact similarities. There's lots of people working on elm. It's, I mean, people have been working on it since Dutch elm disease arrived. Um, we're certainly not the only ones doing it. What I think we are bringing is um, kind of a site-specific lens. We're pairing um, restoration and uh, this kind of genetic experiment. Um, we're using fairly rigorous metrics for what constitutes a survivor. You know, I think that other, other efforts have not really looked at the escaper versus survivor thing as quite as seriously. Um, but I th yeah, so I think what we're really bringing is kind of the site-specific lens, that it's paired with the watershed restoration goals, and that we have um, these mixed plantings that should allow us to accomplish restoration too. So there's not a national Elm conference where you all get together and compare notes. About there it. is. I've never been. Um, is it, yeah, the, there are tons of people working on it. I'd love to go, but um, our Christian Marks, who's our chief scientist on this project, um, has been there, and that some of his work has been published in those proceedings. Yep. In your experiments, when you uh, expose these trees to Dutch elm disease, how long does it take before you know whether or not they're tolerant? About two years. Really? Yeah, it's pretty fast. Wow. Um, when a tree is exposed to the disease, it, it, it dies quickly. Two years. Yeah. The ones that survive, they often do show some limb loss. There's, um, you know, but they're able to compartmentalize the disease a little bit. Um, and then the rest of the tree can thrive and bounce back after that time period. But most trees die within two years. Yep. Are you doing anything along the Mimuski River? Um, not as much. We have a few elms planted on properties that would drain to the Winooski, but we haven't done anything on the riverbanks themselves there yet. A lot of the floodplain that's left on that, the preserved floodplain, is too wet for elms. It's kind of going to be perennially stuck in silver maple territory. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the other lens for both floodplains and elms is that they are one of our most highly disturbed ecosystems because that's where the great soils are. Um, so a lot of them were cleared for agriculture and elm is kind of a, you know, you wouldn't, a lot of agriculture does not persist in the real, like really wet floodplain, but that kind of borderline stuff is really the sweet spot for ag, and that was also a good spot for elm. Yep. How are we doing on time? Getting close. Getting close, okay. Well, we're almost done. Uh, <laughs> and I just wanted to end with kind of a map of uh, where elm grows and just kind of to put these conversations in context and I think your question about who else is working on this is a nice way to pivot into this. You know, we're certainly not the only ones working on it. We're doing our best in our area to kind of help accelerate this to achieve our conservation goals. Um, but we're really hoping that a lot of the lessons and the products that we develop from this work can be shared elsewhere and be, you know, either implemented or just adopted. Yeah because you're not sure that what you're doing over here in Vermont is going to work for elm trees in Wisconsin. Exactly, yep. Um, 
and one of, let's see, so some of the specific goals that we've identified is we think of all the 80 trees we've sampled, we expect at least 10 of those um, to be like high quality disease tolerant trees that can then be released to the nursery trade. Um, we're not there yet, we haven't done the testing, but we think that we'll be able to add 10 more genotypes to the, to the mix. Um, and then just kind of that big vision of we're gonna have a dense, genetically diverse cluster of these disease tolerant elms at the headwaters of some of New England's biggest water bodies. Hopefully they can co-evolve with the disease and be kind of a, an epicenter for elm diversity and that they can kind of naturally set seed and send that down water to start to begin to restore um, some of the downstream floodplains and add diversity and restore some of those critical ecosystem functions we talked about. So that's the big goal. Yeah. And I, I, well, there's a lot of questions. I'm happy to stick around and answer as many as people have. Um, and I want to say thank you all for being such an engaged and wonderful audience. to think, let's see, who's, I think, well, so it's easy to find, it's getting easier to find some of those cultivars. Um, so if you wanted to plant them yourselves, you can do that. Um, and then I know that some urban foresters are considering planting these elms. I know Burlington has a couple um, along the UVM campus, especially, they've planted some. Mm -hmm. And maybe to replace the ash trees that are coming. I know. Elm trees, which are so beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks. You're so welcome. Field work is wonderful. I've done it. Oh, I know. It's definitely the <laughs> We're best. We're so lucky. <laughs> <laughs>